Historically, the vast majority of motors used in uh, residential central vacuums have been made by LAM Electric, now known as Amatec LAM. And LAM Electric started when Edward LAM bought the vacuum motor division from Black & Decker. And they, LAM Electric then started making these little vacuum cleaner motors and selling them to vacuum cleaner manufacturers. So if you open up uh, an old Eureka or an old Kenmore, you'll find a LAM motor inside. Um, and of course, the motors for portable canister vacuums were through flow, meaning the working air that you suck up through the hose and through the bag uh, gets blown past the windings and cools the motor. Well then there was a need for a motor for wet vacuums and the bypass motor was developed and that just takes your through flow motor design and blows the working air out of the fan housing and has a separate stream of air coming down past the windings via a cooling fan to cool the electrical part of the motor and that's why it's called bypass because the working air bypasses the electrical part of the motor. Inside, if you take this shroud off, this is very similar to an early uh, through flow motor from the same time period. They reused the same bearing bridge and field coil and the impellers are the same. They just added a longer shaft, bolted the cooling fan to the end of it and gave you this shroud and of course this this piece would be different but you can always tell a, a bypass motor because um, there's a cooling fan separate from the impellers underneath. LAM was sequential with the model numbers that they used so this is a 115216 and it actually came out of a Hild shop vacuum. One of their earlier motors and by the way, this is a 5.7 inch diameter, two stage vacuum motor. This design, uh, I believe, was around longer. Uh, this is a 114789. This is a 7.5 inch, three stage, three impeller motor. Uh, and starting with the rebirth of the central vacuum industry, uh, owing to lightweight uh, steel tubing and later PVC pipe instead of the heavy iron pipe, um, central vacuum manufacturers started buying motors from LAM and putting them into central vacuums. So this exact motor was used in machines like uh, some of the Cleanomatics and Kenmore's and Vacuflows. This machine was this motor was used in uh, larger Vacuflow models like my H20 that you may have seen the video on. And um, of course, VacuFlow was a cyclonic unit. There was no bag, there was no filter, so a certain amount of dust made its way through the impellers and had to be captured and vented outside. And I believe it was the Bishop brothers that owned VacuFlow, Harold and Paul, that went to Lamb Electric and said, can you make us a central vacuum motor specifically uh, for a machine where the exhaust has to be piped away from the machine? and what they came up with was the 115334 shown here. This is one of the very most popular central vacuum motors historically, not so much anymore. Well these were handmade originally and one funny thing about them is because of the variances in hand manufacturing something, you know they hand wound the field coils, uh, they put a way to tune the motor into the design. If you look here, the field coil is sandwiched between this housing and that housing. It's not actually bolted through. So if you loosen these screws, these slots allow you to twist the field coil slightly and tune the motor to give you specifications that are close to the uh, published specifications for this motor. Now there's a minimum set of specifications here that's 105 inches of sealed vacuum. Uh, your standard would be 110. I've seen these motors uh, do a, a lot less than that and a lot more than that. And that has something to do with voltage drop also, how far away from your uh, electrical panel uh, and how big of a circuit you have these motors running off of. Um, but that's a topic for a different video, not to go on a tangent. <laughs> On the later motor designs, uh, I'm assuming 
because LAM went to automatic field coil winding, so they reduced the variances. Um, you can see that the field coil is through bolted. These two bolts go right through the field, and so it's, there's only one way to put this together, uh, or this one. This is basically the modern day version of this. Uh, it's a 119916. Their newest motors are up to 200,000 something something. Um, but on this one, your field coil is indexed to the scroll housing by these slots that are machined into it and it can't move. But back to this one. If you vary the position of the field coil relative to the brushes, you can slightly vary the speed of the motor. And uh, early Hoover motors, like the Model 102 from like 1918, you could do that on those too. You could rotate the whole carbon brush ring. Um, on this, you're doing the opposite. You're just rotating the field coil instead of the brushes. But let's plug this one in and see how close we're coming now to the factory specification. So that was 115, which is pretty much right where it should be. It's actually slightly higher than it should be. And if you notice, this field coil is rotated all uh, as far, that would be counterclockwise, uh, as it can be. So just for fun, let's loosen these screws. And we're going to rotate that as far, really ideally you'd want it in the middle just for assembly but let's just rotate it as far the other way as it can go. Incidentally, these motors, a new 115334 does not last as long as the old 115334s did. I'm not exactly sure why, but I had one of these running on a machine uh, with an hour meter attached to it, and we were only getting 500 hours. Uh, and I always thought these were good for above 1,000. But one thing I did notice is they switched from a split carbon brush to a single carbon brush. And uh, Amatex official answer was that, uh, well, they don't need the split carbon brushes anymore because uh, the carbon materials have improved. And I didn't bother to respond, but my thought was, if that's the case, then why does this one come with split carbon brushes? Huh? Huh? Okay, anyway, let's try this again now that the field coil is rotated uh, to the opposite position. Okay, so we got that one up to 140, from 115 to 140, simply by varying the position of that field coil. Um, but of course, this is done at the expense of motor life, or brush life more specifically. Uh, the faster a motor runs, the quicker it wears its brushes out. Um, and the opposite is true also. But uh, anyway, I thought you'd find that interesting, and thank you for watching.